Hi, everyone. My name is Connie Edick. I am with the Santa Barbara Audubon Society. I've been a member of Audubon since 2002, and my primary role with Audubon has been as a bird handler for our Eyes in the Sky Live Education Birds of Prey. I've been doing that for 18 years, so I've had the privilege of working with uh, our hawk, our three owls, our falcons, and taking them to schools, different venues, and all that to, uh, to get people up, up close and personal with our raptors. Very, very interesting. Um, just letting you know, I'm a pretty casual birder. I don't even know if I can use birder uh, properly for myself. I like to just get out there and just see what's out there. I don't list. You know, some birders like to do listing. I, I'm just more interested in bird behavior and their natural history. I just find learning more about animals and how they behave really, really lets me in on why humans behave the way they do. There's some clues there. It's kind of interesting. So I, I learned to appreciate birds really late in life. Uh, there's plenty of birders out there who've been birding since they were five. Um, I just started it about 20 years ago. That's really not, you know, blink of an eye for a birder. But I learned to appreciate birds through uh, doing wildlife rehab with uh, Santa Barbara Re um, Wildlife Care Network. And once I had birds in my hand, I was feeding baby birds, I kind of went, huh, these are pretty, pretty interesting creatures. So I got much more interested in birds from that perspective before I ever went out into the field and started birding. And then I also started handling the raptors, the birds of prey uh, with ice and sky, and that uh, really cemented it for me. So that's just a little bit about my background. Just to let you know, I don't know if people are familiar with the Audubon Society. Our, our National Audubon Society was founded in 1905, so it's been around a long time. It's a conservation uh, organization. Santa Barbara Charter was uh, was chartered in 1963, so Santa Barbara Audubon has been around for quite a while. And our goal is to protect area bird life and habitat, connect people with birds through education, conservation, and science. So we're very interested in this sort of venue where we can uh, do some education. And um, we have lots of other things going on. Very active group. I encourage you, if you want to learn more about Audubon, uh, check out our website. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of good work around here, I think. So this presentation is going to be just really a quick introduction to bird song. And really, it's bird sound. Uh, it's more than just bird singing. But we will be focusing primarily on what are called passerines. These are also known as the perching birds or songbirds. We might get a few other birds into the mix here, but mostly we're talking about our songbirds. And I'm going to go into why we might want to listen into these guys. Um, they're everywhere. Um, it's it, they really do tell a story. Once you get kind of familiar with their sounds. Uh, it can tell you a lot about the world you're in at the moment and what's going on, uh, in addition to what's going on with them. So there's kind of like this emotional connection that you can get from that, but it's also giving yeah. you that sense of time yeah. or place. You're on. Okay, That's, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why birds, why are they sounding off all the time? What's, what's up with that? What's their story? And we'll go just a tiny bit into how birds make their sound. And then we'll go a little bit into how we might be able to remember song patterns so we can kind of figure out what birds were hearing and what they're up to, what their intent. And so we will listen to some samples of local songbirds. And when I say local, I'm talking about Santa Barbara, but really this is any any place in Southern California, so it's not exclusive to, to Santa Barbara. And I'll also do a little introduction to our birds of prey. I mean, they have some things to say too. They're not songbirds, but they 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 do say things. <laughs> they do have things to say. 
And uh, then we'll just kind of finish up with some ideas on where to go to find birds locally. And what resources are available mostly online and you know some books. But for now, why don't we just kind of settle in? And I want you to just kind of listen to this it's about a minute. in a day <laughs> at a place that presumably has water going on. It was interesting when I found this clip, um, it was described as a rainforest. And I think I find that very, very interesting because um, it's uh, clearly someplace uh, with uh, red winged blackbirds, which I kept hearing. So I would suspect it's more in North America. It's probably one of uh, you know, some wetlands that we have here. But the thing about this whole clip I really like is that um, you can appreciate songbird for its uh, uh, bird song for its own sake. You know, just like you don't have to know the name of every instrument in an orchestra to enjoy a composition, you don't really have to know or identify every bird to just enjoy the show. It's it's really like this this. Um, this mixture of the, the different birds. Birds are listening to each other. They're answering each other. They're paying attention to what's going on around them. Um, uh, it's just uh, pretty complex. Uh, it's not, you know, a lot of times you might get a, a recording of a bird and you go, oh, this is a red winged blackbird and you hear it exactly and it's all nice and by itself. Well, and in nature, that's not the case. It's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot to do with the environment. What time of day is it? What season is it? Who's walking by? You know, is, is it a human walking by? Is it you know, a dog or a predator? Um, so there's just lots of things going on when we listen to birds. It's not in a vacuum, of course. You know, they're they're actually paying a lot more attention to us than you might imagine. It seems like they're just totally ignoring us and doing their own thing. But a lot of what they do, they kind of do in response to whatever's going on. So like with this, the pandemic, the lockdown that we've been experiencing, there has been uh, really interesting uh, changes in bird activity since then because when, when people were first not moving around a lot, they started coming out more. Maybe it started sounding like they were louder uh, or maybe people paying more attention. It was, it was just, it's just been kind of an interesting thing lately about uh, how, how birds have been reacting. So, you know, with this, the emotional connection with this kind of sound, I mean, this this is the sort of thing that I find very peaceful, even though it's a racket, but it's uh, very peaceful. Um, you know, it just makes me feel kind of uh, privileged to be in on, on uh, being in on this whole thing, you know, being able to hear this. Um, one thing, another thing about birds is that they're they're truly 3D. Um, we're kind of used to being on the ground, you know, got our feet on the ground, gravity holds us there. Birds can fly, of course, and they're everywhere. Um, so they could be in front of you, behind you. Um, 
only that, but when they sing or make noise, they're turning their heads, they're projecting in different directions. There's different reasons why they might do that. Sometimes it seems like they throw their voices, kind of to throw, throw you off as to where they're coming from. So um, that's kind of an interesting uh, complexity to bird song as well, um, which we'll find out a little bit more about. Uh, birds do use their environment to enhance and amplify what they're saying. A lot of times it makes a big difference if a bird is more of a brown bird scurrying around the, the, the brush. Their tones might be lower in pitch than say the birds who are up in the trees who might be higher pitch. It's they're hanging out use the environment to its to their advantage as as far as that goes. Um, one thing also is that a lot, a lot of times you hear birds a whole lot more than see them. Um, they survive because a lot of times they are heard but not seen. And they, they definitely use this to an advantage. They're calling off to each other and yet predators can't really see where they are. So uh, they they really take advantage of that whole thing. So the question would be why bird? And I'm using bird as a verb. At one point, you know, people refer to this whole activity that humans do as bird watching. And it's kind of become this thing, it's birding instead of bird watching, it's birding. And when you think about it, it's a lot more active. It sounds active to, to be birding than to just passively watch. And it's really true. A lot of bird birders tend to really get into um, the, the chase, you know, going out and, and finding that, that bird. Um, so the whole word birding kind of makes more sense because it's not just watching, it's also listening. And the best birders are really good at birding by ear because a lot of times you will hear that bird before you ever see it. And uh, so that's a, a real advantage for those guys who can really distinguish between the different sparrows and you know, those who are trying to ID birds. It's, it's, it's a fascinating challenge to do, to do it by ear. Um, the, the way I'm treating birding in this session, I'm being, I'm going to be using that term very loosely. I, as I said, I'm a very casual birder. I, I know, I know a thing or two, but I, I don't really get into really into the weeds as far as IDing goes. So I, that's kind of my thing. This is my excuse to get outside. It's an, an excuse to go traveling. Um, but really, people can take it to any level they want. If you want to just appreciate the sound, you want to get into IDing or listing, that's great because birds are everywhere. It's it's like you walk out your front door and there they are. And, um, you know, the lockdown with the, the pandemic has really inspired people to do birding at home. And that's perfectly legitimate too. Um, you know, a place like Santa Barbara, lots of people have, uh, there's lots of foliage around, there's lots of opportunities for birds to hang out. So birding at home is perfectly suited to uh, getting you outside, but keeping you safe in, in, in your own, in your own uh, backyard. Um, but again, I think what happens um, with birding, a lot of people just get that real connection with nature. They use bird song to invoke feelings, create mental images, get a real sense of place or, or season or time. And then they also, we also like to use bird song or bird sound kind of like a, as a shorthand for other images or other senses um, that we're trying to invoke. So, um, What we have, let's let's listen to a clip here. Yeah, that's kind of 
an iconic clip. It's been used in movies a lot. Um, I've heard it in other audio recordings, dif different things. And this is one thing that will really get birders twisted in a knot is that in a movie they'll have this sound and they'll show an eagle, a bald eagle. And it's like, uh, no, <laughs> we will be listening to a bald eagle later in the session, but this is actually a red tailed hawk. Uh, red tailed hawks are pretty, pretty common throughout the United States. Um, so you do hear that sound. They tend to stay pretty quiet, but they might make that sound to, you know, when they're attracting a mate or, you know, just kind of communicating. But the thing about that sound, it's like, yeah, maybe it's an eagle or maybe we're talking about the old west. You know, it's talk, someone talks about something, uh, you know, that's in a western and they just put the sound out there like, yeah, that's the West or it's a desert. Um, I've also heard it used for uh, signifying a place that's really high up, you know, just like, OK, it's a high place here. Let's have the sound that'll show you how high up we are um, or a lonely place. It's kind of like, oh, wow, this person, you know, in the story, this person has come to a place and now they're all by themselves. Yeah. You know, they're they're alone. So it's kind of interesting how we'll use those kind of sounds to just kind of evoke something else, you know, besides that it's a bird sound. Here's another one that's uh, been really interesting, especially in movies. Get a load of this. and years and years I thought oh monkeys yeah we're in a jungle we're, we're in you know some really exotic place oh my gosh no these are birds and it's the laughing kookaburra it's a bird that actually lives in Australia and it's uh, a member of the kingfisher family so it's got a really huge head and uh, acts in a lot of ways like our kingfisher that we have here. But again, it's kind of like, OK, we've used this bird sound. We kind of co-opted it for something else that has nothing to do with this particular bird or species. So that's that I've always kind of found kind of interesting how we can kind of do that and uh, you know, get something more, something else out of um, what birds are, are doing. So why? Is there such a racket? Why are they, why are they making this noise? You know, what, what's going on? Um, bird sound, bird songs are very beautiful. They can be very beautiful, but um, make no mistake, it's for a practical purpose. Um, birds are energy conservationists. They they can't afford to waste energy just singing their hearts out and, because they like to do that. Um, they're doing it for a purpose and uh, in listening to birds, we make a distinction between bird song versus a bird call and the song part of it where there's many notes and maybe even a melody is really signifying territory for the most part. It might be the males have have scoped out a territory unlike uh, us. We, we stake out territory, we put up signs, we put up fences. Um, we have all kinds of ways of marking our territory. Uh, wild mammals such as you know, wolves or uh, mountain lions, they will mark their territory with urine because they're, they're basing it on smell. Birds don't have that. They're actually, they're gonna use sound to their advantage. Again, they're 3D. They're up in the trees. They can do that. It's kind of like they can th throw this kind of a, a musical fence, as you will, um, out to say, this is mine. This is my territory. And oh, if you're a lady, um, come on in. I think you want to see my house. You know, come over and, and check me out. Uh, so a lot of times the territorial part advertising for a mate kind of go hand in hand a lot of times. So that's a lot of what 
the song is about. There's several kinds. There's companion calls, um, bonding with a mate, doing duets. We'll hear a few duets in this uh, program. And kind of doing the call and response. I always find that fascinating. You might be somewhere, hear a particular bird sound and listen. Do you hear it somewhere else? You know, a lot of times there might be a reply to that sound. And uh, I always find it interesting. Then I start hearing it going back and forth. And it's a lot of times it's, oh, I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. Where are you? Where are you? And the other one is, oh, I'm over here. And like, well, get over here. Well, and they kind of go back and forth with that. I'm here. Where are you? Um, they will do that a lot of times while they're foraging or even in flight. You know, they kind of put it out there that, hey, here I am. Um, just letting you know. Uh, another uh, uh, call that birds will get into is they'll get kind of the territorial aggression, um, where it's not just marking their territory, that's the singing, but say another bird does come into their territory and they say, what, what? You're not supposed to be here. You need to leave. You need to leave now. Um, so you'll hear this a lot in spring and summer. And what I find really interesting is that birders have used this a lot of times as a way to get birds to come out so they can see them. They will do something called pishing. And it's kind of like it sounds. It's psh, 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 And it's kind of like, hey, 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 I'm out here. <laughs> come out here. I want to talk to you. And it's amazing, a really good pisher can bring a bird to out. This is my place. What are you doing here? So that's another type of call that birds will get into. And then, uh, you know, kind of another scale up from that is alarm. There's like alarm calls. And that's because of predators or other threats showing up. A lot of times it will phonetically match the companion calls, like maybe the little chips or chirps, but they're much louder and more urgent <laughs> and more frequent. So it's like, ah, that, there's somebody here, need to um, pay attention. Uh, the funny thing is that it can also be the opposite. Um, if a bird is singing or birds are kind of calling back and forth to each other and it's all very good and all of a sudden it goes, dead, dead air, absolutely quiet. That could also be a form of alarm. It's like, okay, this is the sort of predator or threat. We don't want to announce where we are. <laughs> so they just go silent. So you might notice that if you're walking somewhere and if you're getting too close to a nest or you're getting too close to whatever, you're hearing the sound and then it stops as you get closer. And as you keep walking by, it comes up again. So it's kind of like, you know, in a sense, they're reacting to you walking by, perhaps. You know, just kind of saying, oh, got to keep quiet. Oh, okay, now Let's go back to what we were doing. So it's kind of interesting that you can have this really uh, loud alarm and then have the absolute silence. And they both kind of mean the same thing, but for different situations. And one other thing I should mention is uh, offspring begging, you know, juveniles, chicks begging. When birds uh, have a nest, you know, their, their, their babies grow their feathers in, pretty much by the time they're ready to leave the nest, it really doesn't take long. They're the same size as the adults, and but they just, don't have uh, the wherewithal to really take care of themselves quite yet. So they will follow their parents around and they will beg. And you can usually tell a begging sound because it is monotonous and it is endless. It just keeps going on and on, feed me, feed me, feed me. A lot of times the par parents are really not saying much. They're just kind of thinking, get a job. Um, but that begging really stimulates the adults to get that baby fit. They want it to shut up. So uh, it's like it works in the scheme of things. Um, 
Let's just hear an example of this. Yes, that could go on for a long time. I had that summer at a crow's nest, and uh, I heard a lot of that. And you'll notice that the baby, this is a baby crow and a parent, and you can tell the baby crows, they're higher pitched. You, know, you notice the, the first thing you heard was this really high pitch, and then you can hear the parents. Um, what's really funny is that they, they beg and they beg and ca ca ca. But uh, when the parent gets ready to feed them, it'll take whatever it has and just jam it down the, the baby's throat and it'll go, ah, 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 ah. and it just sounds like it's being strangled. Well, no, it's actually being fed. It's actually a good thing. But for the longest time, I kept thinking, what in the world is going on there? Um, sounds like the poor thing is getting throttled. But that's, that's the life of a crow. So it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting how they just, they just keep on. So we're going to talk just a little bit about how birds vocalize. You know, I won't we'll get too hardcore into anatomy. I kind of came up with a little diagram just to really uh, set it in my own mind. You know, we, we talk through our, let's see if I can say this right, larynx. L-A-R-Y-N-X. That's quite a word. Larynx. This is a voice box, what we refer to as our voice box. It's really right at the top of our, our, our windpipe, kind of near our throat, just behind our throat. That's how we're talking. So it's kind of like this little voice box that's embedded in our, our windpipe. Birds, on the other hand, have something that is called a syrinx, and that's S-Y-R-I-N-X. Um, it's from a Greek tale. There was somebody by that name. I won't go into the story, but the syrinx in a bird is in a totally different location. It's not near the throat. It's actually very close to where um, the uh, windpipe breaks into two branches going into the bird's lungs. So it's actually um, sitting on top of two uh, valves right there, right, um, right where the bronchial tubes converge. So in a sense, they have two tubes that they're working with to make their sound. And it's incredibly efficient. Um, what it does is it uh, makes sound from all, nearly all of the air that passes through it. And if you want a comparison, our human larynx uses only 2% of our, uh, our exhaled air to make sound. So the birds are using a lot more air Birds are a lot more efficient in their oxygen uh, production. They have not only lungs, but a whole air sac system throughout their whole body. So it's like they're like this little uh, compact air sac. And so they have all this air to work with, and plus they have the two tubes to produce the sound. And so what's cool about them is they can, use both tubes simultaneously. They can use one at a time. They can make a duet with, e with themselves. Um, it's pretty amazing what they can do with that. And the, there's also a whole muscular thing that's, uh, that's involved with this, which determines how well a bird can actually sing. So songbirds sing really well. They have a lot of muscle, fine muscles that can can manipulate the syrinx. 
Um, birds like storks or vultures, those who just kind of grunt, they don't much have much in the way of song. Yeah, not not so muscular there. You know, they don't they don't need their song for, for what the songbirds like to use. So let me give you a couple of examples. And the thrushes are great for demonstrating just how versatile that syrinx can be. a Swainson's thrush. This one of my favorites because it was a total mystery bird to me. I was in Santa Cruz and I was at this beautiful park and I heard this song and I, I thought I had gone to heaven. Uh, I mean to me it was very angelic. Uh, it seemed to echo everywhere. I didn't realize that the thrush was actually creating its own echoes. Yeah, it, but when it's set in the trees, the tall, I think there were redwood trees there. Um, it was ethereal. It was just, it was just amazing. And then you, if you hear several going off at once, it's, it's just amazing. But this is the result of having that two tube system that can make that kind of sound, that it can kind of make a duet with itself. I'll, I'll play another one. Um, and actually the Swainson thrush is one that actually does end up in Santa Barbara, can end up in Santa Barbara in summer. Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever really heard it in Santa Barbara, but I believe they will make their way here. This next one is more of a winter visitor to Santa Barbara. This is a hermit thrush. And again, it's gonna be a little different to check them out. Yeah, just that really fluty, uh, really beautiful tones, and it's it's using its syrinx to its full advantage. I'm going to have somebody else tell you a little bit about another type of bird, and this is uh, our favorite naturalist, David Attenborough. This is an old clip. Um, see what you think. What bird has the most elaborate, the most complex, the most beautiful song in the world? Well, I guess there are lots of contenders, but this bird must be one of them. The superb lyrebird of South Australia. a space in the forest to serve as his concert platform. <coughs> to persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage, and he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. He can imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. Also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. Now, 
the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. That was uh, from BBC, and uh, it was quite dated, you know, camera drive, <laughs> uh, camera shutter, but uh, yeah, lyre birds, very, very good at uh, mimicry as well. There's a lot of birds who can mimic a lot of sounds. Uh, there's other ways that birds make sounds. Uh, I've heard this, this term, nation. Now, it's Kind of funny because it's um, you know it's it's a word that shows up some places and not in others. So I don't know if it's a real word or not. Anyway, it's been used. Sonation is um, sounds that birds can make not using their syrinx. You know, it's kind of any other sound that is uh, not using their voice. So non-vocal sounds. And there's a there's a lot of uh, instances of that, and especially with our local birds, like hummingbirds, of course, their wings hum. Uh, there's also a display dive that they do that produces a chirp. Uh, pigeons and doves will beat their wings very loudly. You've ever noticed them taking off? It's like this really uh, kind of violent uh, wing beating. And a lot of times that's thought to keep uh, predators uh, on their guard. It's kind of, it'll, it'll surprise them and gives that bird a, a little bit of a break to get away. There's also woodpeckers drumming away when they're, they're pecking at the wood. Sometimes it's not just creating a hole. It's not just going after insects. It's not moving acorns around. Sometimes it really is a territorial sound. There's actually a precise rhythm to it. It lets other wood, woodpeckers know, hey, this is my tree, stay away. Um, and uh, used for other purposes as well. And then owls will clack their beaks a lot of times if they're trying to warn somebody off, especially the youngsters, say in a nest, they'll just start clacking, um, just whacking their, their beaks together to, to make a, a, a sound to kind of get people to back off, to get predators to back. So this is a fascinating thing I want to get into is the Anna, Anna's hummingbird has an incredible display. We call it a display when they're trying to attract a mate. And what the Anna, Anna's hummingbird will do, the male will go into a dive and produce a sound and um, thereby uh, attracting a mate. Let's take a, a, a listen to the sound. I'm sure you have heard this. Um, so what is that sound? I remember hearing it for years and, you know, not really under, I thought it was an insect or I thought it was something else. Um, I think I noticed a hummingbird at some point. It seemed to be co uh, coordinated with whatever that hummingbird was doing. I still couldn't quite figure it out. But uh, it's now known, there was a study that was done in just 2008, not that long ago really, uh, by a couple of students from UC Berkeley. They showed that that little chip sound uh, during a hummingbird dive is actually from flaring its tail right at the bottom of the dis display dive. And what the dive looks like, it kind of looks like a, a, a J. What the hummingbird will do is it will kind of hover. It goes straight up, you know, like a little helicopter, goes up about 100 feet, and then it dives straight down and then pulls out of that dive. And Kind of stops about you know a third of the way back up. Um, they are diving 
at about 60 miles an hour. And actually, this is actually faster than the Peregrine Falcon in terms of body size and distance. Now, Peregrine Falcons, yes, they do dive at 200 plus miles per hour. That's incredibly impressive. Um, if you're looking at the size of a hummingbird at 60 miles per hour, it's actually traveling further from body length. So, you know, semantics. We're working with um, different terms of looking at it. Um, back to the study, uh, these people, it was Christopher Clark, Teresa Feo from UC Berkeley, they actually set up uh, a little fake female Anna's hummingbird so that uh, the male would find something to be attracted to. They, they took recordings, they took uh, pictures, they, uh, photographs, at 500 shots per second, I believe. Uh, you know, showing the dive of this bird and because uh, it was kind of thought this was happening, that it wasn't something the bird was saying vocally, it was something else, but these folks really nailed it. They, they got the photographs, they got the recording, they did something with the feathers where they kind of altered them just a little bit and saw if they, if they did that, that the, they, the bird would lose the ability to make that sound. They put it in a wind tunnel. They, they did lots of things to really um, verify that the bird was, was making it from flaring out its tail feathers right at the right moment uh, at the bottom of their dive. Um, by the way, pulling out of that dive is something like 10 Gs. You know, it's incredibly um, forceful what, what they're going through. So I, I find that a really fascinating uh, example of a sonation, something a bird is doing, a sound they're making, but they're not they're not singing, they're not doing their vocal. Another example would be uh, the morning dove, as I mentioned before, they will flap their wings to kind of take off, get away, startle who's ever going after them. A nice, nice little whistle there. Um, I've been startled I, when I was working at Wildlife Care Network. I, when I had to feed the pigeons, I always dreaded it because they would whack me with their wings. Their wings are incredibly fast. I had always jump a foot. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to deal with this, but uh, <laughs> they're, you know, it, it's it's a defensive de device that they that they have. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about interspecies communication, humans and birds. So let's just uh, come back to our friend the crow. So, um, a story for you. You know, crows are really smart. They they actually have been shown to use uh, traffic. They kind of they can kind of gauge the traffic of our cars uh, to help them. They might take a walnut, put it on the road, kind of hang out and wait, have a car run over it, go go get it, and uh, so that's a pretty cool thing. They, there's a study that was done near Boston. Groups of crows were shown to uh, post a sentry crow in a high place to warn the other crows who were picking up the walnut pieces after they'd been crushed. But even with this safety measure, a number of crows were getting struck by vehicles and researchers were trying to figure out why. So the data showed that the crows were getting hit by a particular type of vehicle. You see, the sentry crows were perfectly capable of shouting out a warning for ka, ka, but they could not say truck. 
the, the birds are getting nailed by traps. If you believe that, it's uh, only half true. It's totally made up story, bird trying to speak human. Here's an example of humans trying to speak birds. So we all know this sound pretty well. That's our friend the rooster. And here's a clip of a couple guys who are working at an international news agency. They're talking about the year of the rooster. That was in two, 2017. So these two employees, two guys, uh, Du and Matt, they start talking about the year of the rooster. And this is what happens when the... Uh... Quick, I need your help. No, Du, I'm busy. But Matt, it's year of the rooster. What's a rooster? The rooster wake up the world. How do they do that? In China, the rooster says, Woo, woo, woo! Well, in America, we say cock a doodle doo. Those are completely different. I gotta get to the bottom of this. Oh, what is the sound the rooster makes? In French, le coq says, coq All right, thanks. Nanuka, what is the sound the rooster makes? In Georgia, Manali says, big a little. Thank you. On Listen, Matt, what sound does the rooster make? In Peru, el gallo says kikiriki. Hey, thanks. Uh. <laughs> What's the sound the rooster makes? In India, the murga says kukuruku. Okay. And that is the world today. I'm Asiye Namdar. What is the sound the rooster makes? In Iran, Kuru says wukulikuhu. trustworthy and that they're energetic and that they speak as many languages as we do. So yeah, uh, the comparison between our lar larynx and our syrinx, uh, trying to imitate those sounds, uh, kind of hard, no perfect way to describe a bird sound. Uh, words are inadequate. But, uh, you know, we started off that way. A lot of times, uh, if you look at the evolution of the field guide, it started off as descriptive text, what a bird looks like, uh, what its sound might be like. And it was just trying to get as close as they could to what that bird sound is like. Um, now that we have uh, audio clips, we have lots of applications where you can hear a bird's uh, sound and it's it's much easier to deal with uh, trying to to get those sounds down now we have uh, sonograms um, it's like a picture of what the bird is actually doing it's a visual representation of the sound and you can determine pitch and tune and pattern it's really great for research and really nar you know narrowing down pinning things down as to what what sound that bird is making so uh, the suggestion is, is that if you're trying to think of a sound, trying to remember which bird it is, anything that would work with you is great. I mean, if you want to do an imitation, uh, make it as ridiculous as you can, turn it into words. I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Just what you as outlandish as possible, it might make it as you know, easier to remember. How are we for time, Brianna? I know I've kind of. Uh... Well, I was just going to say it's almost 11. So uh -huh. if, if anyone needs to leave, we understand. Um, but we do have some more fun things to share if you want to stick around. Uh, Connie, how much more time do you think you'll need? Yeah, I think it'll be like another maybe about 15 minutes. Um, if that, I'm going to go mm -hmm. through lo some local birds um, and just just so we get some of the sounds and some identification. Uh, 
um, for people to be hearing these sounds and maybe are curious to what we're listening to. Perfect. And we'll we'll have a little time for questions and comments yes. at the end. OK. OK. All right. This is a, some birds that are my personal favorites. Uh, there's over 200 species of birds in Santa Barbara. We do a Christmas bird count. This is something Audubon does every year, has done for over 100 years all over the country. We actually go out and we count birds. Uh, how many species and how many of each species. So we've always gone over 200 uh, when we count them in December or January. This is just a few of the birds that we might have around here. This is uh, one of my faves. And uh, that is the white crowned sparrow. This is my favorite. To me, it's uh, the uh, signals that fall is here, at least around here. Actually, the white crowned sparrows are everywhere. Uh, these are the ones that will actually migrate up and down the mountain. Uh, I think they come down from the mountains during the winter, go back up the mountains. There's not going north and south. But I, I love these guys. Um, you know, fall is one of my favorite times of year, and that is a sound that we're hearing all over the place right, right this moment. And then we have Yes, that is again the hat, the Anna's hummingbird. You know, they do, they like to sit up and they do that real, real little kissy sound. And of course, that humming sound. They're, they're doing their business right now. It's kind of their time to get together with their mates, start thinking about putting together a nest. They start pretty early in the year. So that's another sound you're going to hear right now. And then we have. Lesser goldfinch. And the reason why I like this guy so much, I, I have some Mexican sage in my yard. The Anna humming, Anna's hummingbird likes to work the sage for its nectar. But the lesser goldfinch comes by when, when the flowers turn into seeds, <clears throat> and that's in the fall. So it's kind of interesting that the hummingbird birds will kind of move out and the goldfinches will move in. And it's the same plant. They're both using it, just different times. Kind of cool. <clears throat> okay, incredibly incredibly high pitch and you'll hear a lot of it all at once. This is a cedar wax wing. This is a bird of our winter. These are winter visitors. Um, they're always looking for the next uh, kegger. Um, they've been known to go after juniper berries, which as uh, you may know is uh, the ingredient in gin. And sometimes when they partake of junipers, uh, juniper berries, uh, Berries are already well past ripe and uh, starting to ferment, and these guys get a little tipsy from it. So it's kind of interesting. They're always in a flock. Um, and that high pitched whistle, I don't know, there's something about, I, you can hear them overhead. I don't see them that often. It's more like I hear them and I go, ah, winter, here we are. Spring is more this.
a, that's a song of a song sparrow. And when I say a song, it's one of many. Actually, song sparrows all have their different dialects. Um, I've done a, I used to work at UCSB. I would take a walk at noon in the spring. I would hear song sparrows like every hundred feet or so, but they were all just a little different. It was really fascinating. They were all just singing their hearts out, but they all had their little territories um, and they all knew where the other guy was. And they had to keep up that singing all day long. Another flocker, um, birds that like to flock a lot. Um, actually, they almost seem like a swarm. These are called bush tits. Do the sound here. So very So very, very tiny little sound. I just love the sound of this and nice to see these little guys come. They're like little tiny ping pong, ping pong sized birds. This is a common one. I'm sure you've heard. House finch. Um, common around here, common around California, there's now a population on the East Coast. Some enterprising person took a whole bunch of these guys and took them to the East Coast, was trying to sell them off as you know, cage birds, uh, referring to them as Hollywood finches because they came from California, so give them a nice fancy name, Hollywood Finch. They do have a very nice uh, red breast or orange breast, and they have that really nice song. It always reminds me that they're they're kind of like asking a question, da 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 what? Da -da 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 -da, what? And then a lot of times they'll answer themselves, what? Yeah. So um, very common around here, very, very delightful to listen to. Another guy we hear a lot is a house sparrow. Now this guy is not native to our area at all. Um, it's more from Europe and England. They are now all over the world. Um, so they're considered exotic. There's just a little bit, a lot of times you go house sparrow, house finch, they both have house in the name. This guy, his, his song's quite a bit uh, less involved. So that is our house sparrow. This is a sound of the wetlands. Uh, if you ever get out to Lake Los Caneros, uh, if you're here in Santa Barbara, this is the sound of the red winged blackbird. And uh, just a really nice sense of place there. A favorite from my childhood. I grew up here in Santa Barbara. This is a sound I heard a lot. That is the sound of the northern mockingbird. We still have them here, uh, a plenty. Uh, good mimics, that like the lyre bird. They, they kind of grab sounds from wherever they can just to make their repertoire nice and big to attract the ladies. And actually the females sing as well. It's not just the males, but uh, I've always liked these guys. It's kind of like a, a, you know, a comfort sound, um, a sense of place again. 
in comparison, let's take a listen to this guy. So that is a California Thrasher. Now, uh, looks it looks very different. It lives in a very different place. It sounds a little bit like the Northern Mockingbird. Actually, it sounds a lot like it, but it's just off, just a little bit. It's um, it's been funny. I'll, I'll be somewhere again. Lake Los Caneros has these guys, and you might hear them and go, "Hey, that's a mocking." Uh, it's a thrasher. So, you know, similar, but just a little different from each other. Um, if you start getting into the foothills just a little bit, doesn't doesn't take too far, you might hear something like this. Yeah, that's the sound of a wren tit. And that name is kind of interesting because it was when it was first being classified, I go, well, is it a wren? Is it in the bush tit family? Oh, we'll just call it a wren tit. And um, so it's got that, that uh, really distinctive uh, bouncing ball sound. Pretty much, I, I like this guy. That, that's the call of a canyon wren. And we have those around here too. Again, it's going to be maybe up into the foothills a little bit. Um, a really nice distinctive sound. One more of a local. a red-shouldered hawk opposed to a red-tailed hawk. The red-shouldered hawk's a lot more noisy. You're more likely to hear these. Now, I hear them all over town, really. They, they like forests, so any place that has trees. Um, and uh, often you'll hear crows going after them as well, which is always a sign if you hear crows making a big old ruckus, chances are they might be going after one of these guys or going after a red-tailed hawk trying to chase them out of their territory. So um, that's kind of like my baker's dozen plus one for local birds. Brianna, I also have our eyes of sky birds, but I think I'll just skip that at this point um, unless people would really like to check them out, but they are not songbirds. <laughs> I would just say at some point, um, you know, we might do something about the eyes and sky birds at a, at a later point. But what I might, um, yes, um, what I might do at this point is just say, you know, where to go if you want to. I'm sure most of you have heard a lot of these sounds. Um, a good way to really get familiar with birds is something called we would call the big sit. If you have a favorite place, it could be your backyard. If you go there maybe the same time each day, you can kind of hear the birds kind of in real time. Um, a lot of times they're going to be doing the same thing each day, uh, just like us. They're creatures of habit. You might find out more about their story uh, that way, especially if you go through the seasons and start hearing birds uh, doing their mating and getting into breeding and nest building and then you start hearing the babies. So it's kind of like a whole cycle. But some of the hot spots around Santa Barbara at least, Lake Los Caneros I've mentioned is a great place. Stevens Park, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, excellent place to hear birds. Botanic Garden, any place where there's really water or foliage, it's a good place to go check them out. And as far as references go, uh, some resources. I used a lot of my material from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. 
excellent, excellent resource. Um, all kinds of information on birds. They, are, they have classes. Uh, they sell tapes and downloads of audio clips. That's where I got some of my, actually I got mine from a CD set of audio clips. Really great. Uh, a book that I can recommend if you want to find out more about what birds are doing when they're making their sounds is a book called What the Robin Knows, and it's by John Young. And what it is, it's, it's more about what birds are doing when they're making the different sounds. I got a lot of my references from that book as well. He goes into visual displays as well, but he does a lot about auditory because a lot of what birds are doing, they will do with sound rather than making themselves vulnerable by being seen, except when they're trying to attract the ladies. Um, so um, that is, those are good sources right there. Um, I would like to end with just a little, just one more little clip. And let me see if I can just fast forward into all this. Birds. Those are those are the five birds. Um, this was put on by uh, uh, NPR Skunk Bear. It's kind of an informational thing that they they have. They have fun with. Uh, that was the Atlantic Puffin was the first one. The Bald Eagle. That squeaky sound. That was uh, seriously. That was the our national symbol. Uh, the Third one where it was kind of gulping and gulping is our American bittern. And the next one where it's who cooks for you, who cooks for you all barking is the northern barred owl. And then the final one was a willow ptarmigan. This is a, a bird that lives up in the in the tundra. Uh, really weird. Anyway, that is uh, my presentation. I am open for questions. Thank you so much, Connie. <laughs> wow, super entertaining and informative. I was very engaged that whole time. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a little time for questions and comments now for anyone who wants to share. Go ahead and just announce your name. This is Nellie. Hi, Nellie. Hi. Um, do you recommend any particular apps uh, for getting bird sounds? Um, I like, I've used a couple. Um, the one uh, a lot of people are using is, let me pull that up. Um, hmm. Merlin is one. It's from Cornell. Again, it, at Cornell actually has a, an app called eBird for birders to track the birds that they they list. Um, but Merlin is kind of the field guide, the electronic app field guide for bird sounds and also uh, visuals and maps and all kinds of information. 
Another one that I have been using for years and I really, really like is called iBird Pro. And mm -hmm. iBird Pro, gosh, I got that before I had a cell phone. I actually put it on some kind of um, small player. And that is uh, another bird ID app that's really good. It has bird sounds. Um, is it that letter I or E-Y-E? It's I. I I I I B I R D so I bird and okay. I got I bird pro you can get I you, I believe you can still get I bird free um, but it's pretty limited if you get I bird pro I think at the time I spent a whopping twelve dollars for it or something oh, okay Thank yeah you. It wasn't it wasn't much yeah that help yes thank you you're welcome yeah. Yeah, this is Liz, and I want to thank you. That was a fabulous presentation, and I have two things I'd like to ask you. I have a lot of crows in my neighborhood, and sometimes uh, I hear them calling to each other, but they sit on top of my chimney, which reverberates down into my family room, and uh, it's wonderful, the sound, but they make the, what is the sound that they make clicking uh, like a castanet? What, uh, what is that signifying? They make that castanet sound very quickly yeah. clicking their beaks together. Yeah, I've heard that sound a lot and I'm afraid I can't tell you. Um, you know, they oh. have so many, they have so many sounds that they use and that, that is, uh, gosh, that is one I don't know. It's some kind of communica communication thing. I don't, it's not, it's clearly not really an alarm. It's not really singing. Actually, I, I have to say, I don't know. Well, I, I guess that'll have to be uh, the project for you guys to figure that out for us. I, yeah. And, and yeah. the other thing I wanted to mention very quickly is that in case you have any spiders, uh, nests or spider webs up in your uh, the top part of your porch or whatnot, uh, I know that the hummingbirds come and take the spider silk which is strong as it's very very strong and they wrap that around little twigs to make their nests oh wow yeah yeah that's, that's right you know the other thing that hummingbirds do when they're gleaning um spider webs is they're actually eating the spiders um we think of hummingbirds as only drinking nectar but they do need some kind of protein and they actually will go through spider webs. They'll check them all out and see if there's any little tiny spiders that they can gulp up. Oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. yeah, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Helen. Yes, hi Helen. Hi, um, I, you mentioned the northern mockingbird. Do we have mockingbirds here in Ventura County? Yes, yes, you should. Are they common? Are they fairly common? They're pretty common, although I have to say just from where I've been living, I live in um, near Goleta, I've seen them kind of come and go over the years, like uh, for a while they were kind of hanging out here and then they they disappear for several years and you know so I think they kind of move around kind of depending on what territory they want to investigate um but yeah they're pretty pretty common in California and I don't know maybe in Ventura I would think now you know all the fires that we've gone through the last few years has really moved the birds around a lot um I've seen birds here that I've never seen before and I've had birds leave that have been common and I think it's, you know, the fires might have pushed them around, but they should be around. Um, it's just kind of depending on what they they see as a good environment for themselves. And I, can I ask one last thing? It's just a silly trivia question, movie, yeah. movie buff trivia. Yeah. In the movie The Birds, Yeah. did they get the right bird sounds to the right birds? Oh, wow. That's interesting. Well, I think the, gosh, these crows. They used crows and they used another fairly large, well, I didn't see seagulls, but. 
Yeah, they had the gulls, they had the crows, and they had the small birds. And to tell you the truth, gosh, it's been a few years since I've seen that. Okay. And they definitely Liberty did an incredible job. I mean, they had fake birds and, <laughs> and puppet birds and real birds. And I don't know what the small birds were. You know, they almost look like kind of like. Hmm, but would you say they predominantly use the crow as the the sound, the bird sound? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, some of it sounded kind of deep. I don't know if they were using like ravens. I think oh, they might have the raven. also been using some sound enhancements um, to make it more ominous. Um, certainly, like the very last scene when they're leaving, and it's ugh, that sound. Oh my goodness! You know the, the seagulls and the other birds, and they're just kind of making this it's almost like that castanet sound at the end. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I can't swear to what um, what it is. I, my my knowledge of the little birds is a little limited. Um, and I know I've, things I've read about that movie, they did do some interesting um, enhancements, I shall say. <laughs> At least they didn't they didn't try to pass off uh, a red tailed hawk as an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's right. Bothered. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I have one last question for uh -huh. you, and yeah. that would be uh, you're mentioning um, uh, app downloads. How did you spell Merlin? M E R L I N. Yes, M E R L I N. Merlin. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's, so that's, yeah, that's, it's, yeah. It's it's like the Falcon, and like the Wizard. Um, yeah, that's um, that's kind of the companion to uh, E Bird. Now, eBird, as I said, it's an app that birders like to use to track what they've what they've seen, what they've observed. Oh. Uh, and uh, since that's more of a tracking thing, it doesn't really have ID sounds in it so much. So Merlin kind of takes up with that. They kinda, they kind of work together. And again, okay. it's all out of Cornell, Cornell University um, Lab of Ithaca, Orth New York. Yeah. Yes, it's Ithaca, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And so iBird is uh iBird is another one that would be pro or regular. I'll try both. Yeah. I said I've got the pro. I can't even think how I still use it. Uh it's probably been well over ten years or something. I still have the same app. Um and it's very useful. The thing uh, the other thing I you know they say if you if you have these tools in your hand and you're out in the field, um, there's an ethical thing of trying not to use them to call birds out or disturb them, but you know just use it for ID. So that's kind oh, of oh yeah yeah provision there. Yeah. Oh, what about this? this what is, about uh, it's called a gackle, the little black birds, the uh, wide-tailed gackle. It's a little bird, but it's black. So it could be a and and thank you for that information because I kept saying why do I never see a baby crow? I never saw a baby, and that's because the babies are as big as the adults. Amazing. Yeah, it yeah. Once they leave the nest, they are as big as the adults. Oh. Uh, the funny thing about uh, babies is be besides their monotonous uh, begging, is they have blue eyes, and the adults have black eyes. Oh um, my gosh. So a lot of times, and what they will do is the, the baby crows will leave the nest and they haven't gotten their flying down yet. So what they'll do is they'll end up on the ground, which is fine, and they're wandering around. Believe me, I had I had a couple of them actually approach me <laughs> this summer and I'm standing on the porch and they go, oh, will you feed me? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no, get away from me. Um, but, They'll, they'll spend pretty much the first week on the ground and the parents will continue to feed them. And for some reason they, that evolutionarily that has worked for them. 
and but it, within a week they're flying and then they're they're still following their parents you know begging um but sometimes people will see a baby crow they're walking around oh the poor thing it can't fly i think i'll pick it up and take it to wildlife care and it's kind of like no just leave it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is Molly. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I really hope that um, that you can come back in the future and do the um, eyes in the sky part of uh, your presentation. I'm sure that, you know, it would be really informative and interesting. Oh, great. Yeah, actually, um, either I could do that or we, we do have some presentations kind of associated with just them. So, yeah, I think we'd be pleased to do that. That's fabulous. I just wonder uh, what you thought when you said, oh, the Braille Institute wants us to come and make a presentation and we we couldn't see, I couldn't see a mosquito if it were biting my hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was thrilled because I went, oh, how perfect. I just thought it was perfect because uh, yes. there's so much to bird sound. And, um, you know, sometimes birders, when they first start, they're all into, oh, does that have a little black dot on its chest? And it's like, no, let's not get into the weeds like that. You know, it's kind of like hearing the bird is something that becomes very important pretty early on because uh, a lot of times birds are not sitting still um, and um, or they're really camouflaged. I mean, they don't want to be seen. But uh, hearing that, I just, I thought for, for Braille Institute, I thought it was perfect. I was very excited to uh, dig into sound more. You know, it's something oh, that I think more training in. So yeah, uh, yeah this is great. The, the other thing I wanted to mention for everybody is I planted some pyracantha, uh, which has red berries and I have more birds coming to eat the red berries, particularly in the cold weather. And uh -huh. pyracantha grow tall, and they're always, uh, I can see the shadow of the pyracantha uh, um, shaking when all the birds, and I sit out there and listen. But if you plant stuff that the birds like, what an entertainment. It sure is better than uh, any entertainment I know, knew about when my neighbors are busy cementing and putting kitchens in their backyard. You have one kitchen. How much do you eat? You know, <laughs> Feed the birds is my thing wildly good point no excellent yes if you can if you can garden for birds and butterflies and yeah. all that that's that's <laughs> great another another thing if if you don't have much space or you don't have uh, you know if it's hard to garden or put stuff in bird baths are really good um yes yes you know, some people use have bird feeders and that's fine i I stopped using a bird feeder a long time ago because it's like, well, I'm always filling it and uh, it attracts other things too. Um, but bird baths are, are excellent um, bird magnets. Uh, that'll pull them in and, you know, it's, it's kind of a gas to hear them um, uh, having their pool parties. Uh, sometimes they're, they're out yeah, there splashing, yeah. splashing. Yeah, good for you. And Valerie, I think had a question. Do you still have a question, Valerie? Um, I think um, I saw a while ago um, an app recommended. It was I guess it was because it was accessible. So there's a site called Applevis for the blind that um, recommends which apps are accessible and which ones we can use. They did have one there that was an Autobahn bird guide, um, but I'm not sure what the cost was. I remember seeing that like a couple months ago. Oh, oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So Apple mm -hmm. Viz gives out the accessible apps is what she was saying and Audubon Bird Guide was one of those. So that's a great one to know about. Yeah, that is. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. 